Uh, homework aid is due on Monday, and uh, today we're going to go over the last piece in that puzzle where we'll be talking about incremental benefit cost analysis. Uh, I hope that uh, also in parallel with that, you're also spending some time thinking about the project. Um, I've talked to a few people who are most of the way through the analysis for the first four uh, scenarios and are now starting to personalize the approach with all of the assumptions with your own personal income and living expenses and savings preferences and so on. Uh, any announcement related questions before we start talking about incremental benefit cost analysis? Okay. How many people here have heard of Gravina Island in Alaska? No, I've never been there. Um, it's an island that's across from the Alaskan town of Ketchikan. Um, how many people here have heard of the Bridge to Nowhere? A couple of people. It, it was a big political issue maybe eight or ten years ago, the Bridge to Nowhere. Um, basically, the people of Ketchikan, when they want to go to the airport, have to take a ferry. And ferries are not convenient because they only go on a certain schedule. Uh, you have to plan ahead. So even if the ferry goes as often as every 30 minutes, if you miss the ferry, then that means that now you have to wait 30 minutes for your next opportunity to go to the airport. And people are never more stressed out than when they're late for a flight and trying to hurry to the airport. So the people in Ketchikan would rather have a way to drive to the airport instead of taking the ferry. And so there was a proposal to build a bridge from Ketchikan towards the airport. And the, uh, the estimated cost of that was going to be $398 million. And you know who's to say if that's a lot of money or a little bit of money? But Ketchikan's a pretty small town. If you look at the map, there's only a couple of streets. I'd say it looks quite a bit smaller than Huntington's downtown area. So not a big population, and $400 million is kind of a lot of money. So ultimately, it was decided that that wasn't a good idea. They didn't build the bridge to nowhere, but they did start on the bridge to nowhere. Uh, they spent $28 million just roughing out the, uh, clearing the path for the road 3.2 miles. So they didn't pave it. They just knocked down the trees and put gravel and it cost $28 million to do 3.2 miles there. You know, I'm sure there was some engineering spending. There was environmental review spending. Um, it was a big waste of money in the end, especially because it never got used. Right now, it's not a bridge to nowhere, at least. But it is a road to nowhere, because it, uh, here's, the, here's the road that connects nowhere to the airport. And then here's the town of Ketchikan. Um, so bad ideas get undertaken all the time. Unfortunately, we do not live in a society where bad ideas are eliminated before the money starts to get spent. Um, it's definitely an ideal that we should work towards, the, the notion that projects should be undertaken on the basis of merit and that spending should reflect efficiency and need. But for a lot of reasons, partly political, partly because of human nature, um, sometimes money gets spent poorly. You know, speaking of human nature, think about who has the incentives when there's a proposal to spend $400 million. Um, the people in Ketchikan, they love the idea because it's going to save them 29 minutes when they want to drive to the airport. And they don't have to pay the $400 million. That's going to be spent uh, mostly federal spending. So um, who else loves the idea of building a bridge to nowhere? Well, probably the person who's going to be building the bridge, because that's a big contract for them. So the people of Ketchikan are highly motivated. The construction company is highly motivated. And who's on the other side saying that's a bad idea? There's not very many people who have as many concentrated incentives to suggest they shouldn't do it, because it's a distributed cost. Like every American, if they did build this bridge to nowhere, every American would be contributing about a dollar. 
I mean, I'm not going to go to a public meeting to save a dollar. I'm not going to write an email to save a dollar. So the upside is concentrated in a small number of hands. The downside is distributed across a lot of people. So that's part of the reason why bad ideas happen all the time. So that's a depressing way to start class. But what I can do to kind of snap you out of it is teach you a new way to assess opportunities that hopefully if you're like me and you believe that money should be effectively spent, that merit should be the, the kind of the guiding factor for how we decide on which projects are undertaken, these tools are very critical. And so today we're going to continue what we talked about with benefit cost and see how it can be used to choose from among alternatives. So remember from last time, what we said was that there's this ratio we can calculate. And broadly speaking, it's a ratio of benefits in the numerator, costs in the denominator. And if there's more benefits to cost, then a project is justified. Now, it's only justified assuming that you've correctly um, monetized your assessment of the benefits and disbenefits. And so one of the tricks that people will sometimes do is they'll exaggerate the value of the benefits. If they want a project to go and they kind of know it's on the borderline, um, they will say, well, it's worth $20 an hour for people not to sit in traffic, even though the actual economic value of that may be much lower. Or they will neglect disbenefits that are likely to arise. There could be noise, environmental pollution, delay during construction, and sometimes those things are hidden to try and artificially inflate the benefit to cost ratio. I was going to ask about either time or like urgency being the criteria. Is there anything where you factor that in? Um, you mean in the case of like a project that's an emergency? Necessary. I guess so, yeah. Like say a bridge that was starting to collapse and you have to drive away to fix it. Yeah. Well, I think you could still apply this criteria and say, you know, if we don't move quickly, then what are the costs? You know, like, if you don't do the repair, is it possible the bridge could fall in the water and you could lose it altogether? So I think that there probably is a way to, uh, to work time considerations into benefit cost. Um, all right, so everybody understands that this ratio is supposed to be bigger than one. If it's greater than one, that means you're getting, for every dollar you spend, you're getting more than a dollar in benefits. And that's a good deal. Like when you spend a dollar, if you got more than a dollar back, you should go for that deal. You should keep going for that deal as long as you're going to get more than a dollar back for every dollar that you spend. Like if I said, I'll give you $10 if you give me nine, you'd take that trade, right? But what if I was willing to continue? What if I said, OK, so we'll make that trade. I'll also give you $9 if you give me 8. You should take that trade as well, because you're getting more benefit than cost. What if I said, I'll give you 2 pennies if you give me 1? It's still, you should keep saying yes as long as the benefits are greater than the cost. OK, just for a moment, I want to take your mind back to um, to IRR analysis. Do you remember that IRR shouldn't be used for comparing alternatives? What should you use IRR analysis for? When you've got multiple alternatives, what's the appropriate way to use IRR analysis? Like just accept it, like, or not. To see if you should, uh, like initial screening, we could call it. Like a yes versus a no. Why is it that we can't just choose the project that has the highest internal rate of return. Because it's like the, the cost may be different, like there might may be different like factors. Okay, because of the difference in initial cost. So the lesson that we learned from that when we were looking at IRR, we did a proof and we saw there was a case where the project that had the highest internal rate of return on a percentage basis, that project didn't necessarily yield the most present value. That didn't maximize the profits. So that was back when we were talking about picking the project that's the most profitable. We're in a new phase of the course where we sometimes also are evaluating public sector projects that have more factors besides profitability to consider. 
but the same restriction and the same lesson that we drew from IRR analysis also applies to benefit cost analysis. So here's the thing I want to say. This is the main thing. Take a note, write, uh, underline it. Just because some alternative has the highest B to C ratio doesn't necessarily mean that's the best project. So when you're picking which of the alternatives should be undertaken, like if they're different prices, it's not just picking the one with the highest B to C. For similar reasons as the other case, we want to maximize benefit. We don't want to maximize some arbitrary ratio. We want to keep saying yes as long as we're getting more than a dollar in benefit for every dollar of costs. So because of that, because we can't just pick the alternative that has the highest B to C ratio, we need some other technique for sorting and evaluating multiple alternatives. So let's say that our objective was to prevent flooding. And there were three different ways to prevent flooding for a certain location. You could build a flood wall, which Huntington has, by the way. Huntington has a, a flood wall. And let's just say, hypothetically, that was the cheapest option of the three. And slightly more expensive than building a flood wall would be that you could raise all of the homes in the area that needs to be protected. And then that way, if the flood waters rise, all of the damageable property is above the water line's likely elevation. So between the two, there is some difference in costs. There's some difference in benefits and disbenefits. If we wanted to compare the two alternatives, what we'll focus on is the increment. Remember increment, we've, we've talked about increment before. It's the difference between alternatives. So even with benefit cost analysis, we're still going to focus on in what way are two alternatives different. And so what we could do is we could look at, for that incremental cost, benefits, disbenefits, what is the B to C ratio of the difference? Of course, we will have already done an initial screening of B to C ratios just to see whether the projects are acceptable to begin with. So let's assume that all these three options already passed the initial screening because they have a B to C ratio of greater than 1. But now, we know they're all potentially acceptable. We're trying to find out which one is best. So the way that we find out which one is best is by calculating the B to C ratio of the increment. And so the same thing, if we found that raising the homes was the better option, then our next comparison would be between raising the homes and putting in pumps to lower the flood waters if that occurs. So there would be some difference in costs, benefits, disbenefits. We'd analyze the difference. So we can do this incremental analysis to compare alternatives and choose which one is the best. So for every matchup that you're going to do, just like it when we did incremental IRR, in incremental B to C, you'll also do like a one versus one matchup of alternatives. You'll compare for two possibilities, what's their difference in initial cost, their difference in maintenance and operation costs, the difference in benefits, the difference in disbenefits. So remember that we have to put all of the time of the money into the same frame. So all of the costs, benefits, disbenefits either need to be at the present or all at the future or all on an annual basis in order to calculate the ratio. And so the B to C incremental ratio formula looks very similar to the formula that was utilized just to calculate the B to C to begin with. We've just simply added this delta sign before everything. And delta means the difference between alternatives. So any questions so far? So what I hope you know by now is, number one, why we need to calculate benefit cost instead of calculate a rate of return. Like, we couldn't calculate the rate of return on a flood wall because it's not going to generate revenue. Nobody's writing a check to the flood wall each month. It's not directly generating revenue. It generates benefits, like the damage that would have occurred during a flood is avoided. So that has an economic benefit. 
people are less worried about flooding. That has a benefit. Businesses are willing to move into the neighborhood if they know that it's less likely to flood. That has a benefit, but it's not necessarily going to generate income constructing this flood wall. So we can't just calculate a rate of return because the benefits are non-economic. The other reason that we need to calculate the incremental benefit to cost is because if we have multiple alternatives, we need to be able to choose which one is best. So here's our method. We're going to substitute the benefits that between alternatives, the disbenefits between alternatives and the costs into either the conventional or the modified formula. And then the interpretation or the decision criteria is that when the incremental ratio is greater than one, choose the more expensive alternative. And so in subsequent comparisons, then that more expensive alternative would be the defender when you have uh, another matchup. Um, the B to C ratio being less than one, then you should choose the less expensive alternative. Because what it means is that the added cost between the two alternatives is giving you less than a dollar of benefits for every dollar in cost. So there is kind of a, a physical interpretation of this ratio. The more expensive alternative is worth it if you're getting more than a dollar back for every dollar that you spend. But the more expensive alternative is not justified if you're only getting, say, 80 cents of benefit for every dollar of added cost. Any questions? All right. There's a template file that I put onto Blackboard. It's just here in the, uh, the course page. And you're going to need it for today's in-class exercise. It's down at the bottom of the front page. It's called ICE 23 template for incremental B to C. So if I open that up, I wanted to save you the time and the potential for transcription error in just typing in the table of the data that I'm going to give you. In this scenario, we are considering five different options to prevent flooding. And they're not named. We're just giving them a label, options A through E. Um, and what we want to do is, number one, determine which of those options are acceptable, potentially. So do an initial screening by calculate the B to C. And then we want to do an incremental analysis, a sequential incremental analysis. And the sequence is that we'll start with the cheapest option and compare it to the next most expensive alternative. And any time the incremental B to C ratio is greater than 1, we'll choose the more expensive alternative. And if not, We'll stick with the cheaper alternative. So these different uh, ways of preventing flooding have costs. And you'll notice that the costs are already in the present. But all of the rest of these things, it says, are annual. The project's lifespan is 75 years. And we're using a 6% discount rate. Let me give you the handout. The template file that I've provided kind of implies a procedure. So read through what it says in the handout, then look at that template and see if you can figure out what needs to happen. I'm suggesting that in order to calculate this ratio, we'll take everything to the present. So let's go with that. Rather than taking everything to the future or calculating the annual equivalent, Let's just take all of the different money and find the present values of each category.
Okay, so let me show you just a couple of things that we haven't done before. One is for calculating the sum of the benefits. You can embed a function inside of a function. So it's hard to see because it's so small, but let me just show you how I calculated the benefits of everything. So equals PV, and you refer to the rate by clicking at the rate, refer to the N by clicking here, and then in the, uh, the field for PMT, I'm going to say negative and put an extra set of parentheses there. And then I'm just going to say it is, I'll click on the location, that amount plus this and that. So all three things together are going to be added. And then that combined amount will go into the PMT field of the present value function. Okay. So uh, the interpretation is that we're going to reject E. E is no good. So let me, off to the side here, have conclusion. So I could just manually type in OK, 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 no. If you have a lot of options, you could do like a conditional statement. So like equals if, parentheses, if this is greater than or equal to 1, then have it say OK. Otherwise, have it say no. And then that way I don't have to manually type in my conclusion statement. It would just look at the ratio and then tell me if it's OK or if it's not OK. Thanks. Okay, so if I, if I distribute that function down, then it, it'll automatically interpret what's good and what's bad. Or I could even do conditional formatting this way. I could highlight on the cells, and I could create a new rule. Conditional formatting, uh, new rule, and I'll say that, um, let's see based on their values. No, I think maybe I'd want to do it this way. Um, I'm not sure how to manually put this in. OK, the formula. So if it is greater than 1, then we would want it to be highlighted. Greater than one. Oh, I didn't tell it what to do. I don't want to get wrapped up in the formatting. Um, so you basically are going to throw out option E. And so our first matchup is going to be B versus A. Not A versus B. We're, saying, we're calling it B versus A just to reiterate that the incremental cost is the more expensive minus the less expensive. So the incremental cost, um, the incremental present worth of the cost. I could actually just drag this formula sideways. I could go like to the side and it's going to calculate the increment for each of them. The, in, the, the delta BC is not just the difference between 2 and 1.8. The delta BC, remember what we're doing to calculate that is we're using this formula. Use the deltas to calculate the delta BC. So it will be the delta benefits minus the delta disbenefits divided by the sum of the costs. Okay, so that's 2.75. And so the interpretation is um, choose B. B is more expensive. Since the ratio is greater than 1, we should choose B. Because like looking at the difference between B and A, here's the extra cost and look at the extra benefits are higher and the disbenefits are less. 
So the value of the added benefits and the fact that you have even fewer disbenefits means that option B is a lot better than option A. Option A costs less, but option B is better because you get $2.57 of value for every $1 of cost. Okay, so the next matchup would be option C versus option B. Okay, so again, we can have the value here of C minus the value of B and then drag that formula sideways. And then this formula where we had calculated the delta BC, we can drag that one down. And it says 96 cents of value for every dollar of cost for option C. So what's the interpretation here? Should we go for the more expensive alternative or keep the cheaper one? Keep the cheaper one. So we will say keep B. So then the final matchup that we're supposed to do is D versus B. You don't do D versus C because you've just rejected C. So we do D versus B. D minus B. Choose D. So the conclusion, the alternative that is best, we should select option D. This one? Okay, at the bottom of the page it asks one final question. And to answer this last question, question two at the bottom, um, I suggest you create a copy of this. So down at the bottom where it says template, if you right click on that, if you right click where it says template, uh, move or copy, and then select create a copy and move to end. So there's going to be the original, which it called template. I'm going to rename that question one. And then the other one I'm going to call question two. And the advantage of creating that copy is like I can now tinker around with things on question two and not mess up my answer from question one. Right click and then create mover copy. So the last question is asking, what is the highest interest rate that could be used and still have an alternative that has an acceptable B to C ratio? So this is just asking, what if interest rates go up? So it's nothing about an incremental analysis. So I'm going to delete this incremental analysis part of it on the second question. I'm going to delete the answer to the first question. Okay, so what this is focusing in on is if the interest rate goes up, how high could the interest rate go and still have an acceptable alternative? So we're just looking at this tells us if the, accept, if the alternative is acceptable. So if the interest rate went from 8%, or from 6 to 8, they're all still okay. If the interest rate rises to 10%, we're getting really close. Option D is about to become infeasible at 11%. Now we've just lost option C and option D. But option A and B are still all right. How high can we go? 13? Well, I should say 0.13. There we go. At 13%, only B remains. So at this point, it's like a goal seek. I want to know how high can the MAR get, and option B is still at or greater than 1. So I'll do data, what if analysis, goal seek, and my objective is to set this to 1 
by changing the mar. OK, and if I want to show more digits of precision here, it's 14.50% is the highest interest rate that we could go and still have one of these options be acceptable. Option B is acceptable, but if it was like 15%, then even option B is no longer acceptable. No. Uh, the highest interest rate that could be used and still have an alternative that is acceptable uh, is 14.5%. So answer, 14.5% is the highest interest rate that would yield an acceptable project. Okay, we're out of time for today. Remember that you have homework eight, which is due on Monday. I'll see you then.